People talk about Silicon Valley um, engineers being risk takers, and I think it's it's actually the opposite. It's the realization that if you go and try one of these things, and you're actually good at what you do, if it fails, it fails. You'll, yeah. you, you'll have a job the next day at somewhere else, right? And you'll have this wealth of experience that people will value. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello, and welcome to our first episode of Behind the Tech in 2020. I'm Christina Warren, Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. And I'm Kevin Scott. All right. So, Kevin, it is 2020, which is both the new year and, and I guess, a new decade, although people will get weird about the technicalities. And uh, it's always <laughs> a, a great uh, chance to kind of look back at what's happened over the last 10 years and reflect on new opportunities. Yeah, I mean, it... It is, I think, in our industry and for human beings in general, really easy to get completely used to new innovations that enter our lives. But like when you think back 10 years ago, the world looked like a very different place than it looks right now. So smartphones were just catching on. They were nowhere near as ubiquitous as they are right now. And the things that you could do on them were far, far more constrained than they are right now. I mean, for... For God's sake, people were renting movies from Blockbuster in, right. uh, in 2010. Right, right. Blockbuster was actually still a thing. And Instagram hadn't even been invented yet. Totally different world. Like, <laughs> you know. Um, do you Now that we've hit 2020, do you have any forecasts about what the next year um, in tech might bring or even the next decade? Well, I think one of the themes that we spent a bunch of time chatting about last year on the podcast was artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I think we are certainly going to see the trends that uh, that had started in the prior years continue to accelerate. It's one of the reasons why I'm uh, really interested in chatting with our guests today. Um, so autonomous vehicles, for instance, I believe are going to make a ton of progress over the next couple of years in particular. Uh, and I'm just sort of really looking forward to uh, seeing some of that stuff play out. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. It's funny. I don't have a driver's license, um, but I've actually been on a few self-driving car panels over the years. And I, I think the technology behind it is so fascinating, which is why I'm really, really excited um, about your conversation with today's guest, Chris Ermson. And Chris is an engineer who's known for his work in pioneering self-driving car technology. Yeah, and, you know, one of the reasons that I'm especially interested in self-driving cars and am looking forward to this conversation that we're about to have with Chris is that um, there's so many ways that the world is going to change for the good once we are able to put this technology into the hands of lots of different companies. So uh, one of the things that we'll hear about Aurora is they are a company building the self-driving car technology as a platform for other companies to use to build autonomous uh, applications. And so, you know, like one one of the things that I'm sort of hopeful that will come into the world in the not too distant future is uh, uh, some technologies that may help my uh, grandmother. So I'm lucky enough to have a grandma that's uh, still uh, still alive. She's uh, 89 years old and lives in a very, very rural place in Virginia. And she can still drive, which is awesome. But the the day is coming where she's not going to be able to uh, to drive her car in the same way that she is right now, and uh, like then it begs the question of how she has access to all of the things that she needs in order to help her live an independent life. So how does she get her prescription medicines? Like how does she get her groceries and, uh, you know, just sort of the staple things that she needs to exist? And one of the things that I think 
uh, could be really incredibly beneficial with these self-driving technologies is uh, like the the possibility that you'll be able to have autonomous deliveries uh, for people like my my grandmother. I think you're absolutely right. I think the potential for this stuff is really fantastic. So let's hear more uh, about some of the potential for this technology from Chris Ermson. Our guest today is Chris Ermson. Chris is the co-founder and CEO of Aurora, a company that builds self-driving vehicle technology. Before founding Aurora, he was CTO of Google's self-driving car program. Prior to that, Chris was a faculty member of the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, where he was the technical director of the DARPA Urban and Grand Challenge teams. I'm really excited to hear what he's up to these days. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I'd love to start by learning how you got interested in technology in the first place as a kid. Were you taking uh, engineering classes or programming classes when you were in high school? So, or you no, just but, discovered that in college? Back when I was in high school, there wasn't really computer science at high school. Yeah. Um, and so I uh, bought a some kind of Tandy X86 clone or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, back when I was in probably ninth or 10th grade from money from my paper route. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, tried to learn to program at first where you go, you know, I don't know if you recall this, but you go to the bookstore and you'd buy, uh, you know, this paperback book that was, you know, program, whatever it was. And it was just the source code listing. Yep. And, and this is before CD-ROMs even. Yeah. Oh, which, yeah. Which, pe- which people probably don't even remember now. That, that, that's right. <laughs> you know, like I, like we, uh, before that, actually, we'd bought a Commodore 64. Mm-hmm. And, of course, that was exciting because it didn't have a tape drive. Right. Right. Uh, or it, it didn't have a floppy disk did, drive. It didn't have a floppy, yeah. And, and like and it, had, it, it had five and a quarter inch discs. Mm-hmm. That's what it had. Yeah. Yep. So, so anyway, so we was doing that, and then um, uh, learned there's this language C plus plus, which seemed to be the hot new thing, uh, and so started actually the first program language I really learned was C plus plus. Wow, that's rough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it was. Yeah, it was. It was a little crazy, and I. Um, I mean, and I guess on some some level, like C++ is a challenging first language, but uh, the good thing is after you've mastered it— It's all uh, downhill. <laughs> it's, it's all downhill. Yeah. Um, and so did you know from all of this experience in high school that you wanted to get a computer science and engineering degree? You know, I was up in Canada, so applied to you know, a variety of schools, got into into a couple of them. Uh, and then in my senior year, I met a girl. Um, turns out now she's my wife. Uh, and uh, decided I wanted to stay at the University of Manitoba, mm-hmm. uh, which is right in central Canada, in, in Manitoba, and got into the computer engineering school. Computers seemed like, you know, they had a future. Yep. And how – and so you, you got your undergraduate degree and you went straight to grad school, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, and you went to grad school at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Yep. So how did you how did you know you wanted to go to uh, CMU? One day, uh, I was in the engineering building just outside the library, and there's this poster next to the elevator that showed this robot crawling out of a volcano. Uh, and I saw that, I thought, that's really cool, right? <laughs> like, I like robots, I like space, this seems exciting. Yep. And my my... My girlfriend said, you know, you should really apply if you think that's cool. And I figured, you know, it's Carnegie Mellon. It's like there's no way. Um, how am I, you know, at the University of Manitoba, how am I possibly going to get in there? And, you know, they made a mistake. Um, but, but, <laughs> well, no, I, I, I think they did not make a mistake. Well, <laughs> you know, we'll see. But, uh, but yeah, no, it was really like, – I've been fortunate throughout my career to kind of look at, hey, this seems interesting. This seems kind of cool and fun. Um, and, you know, gone and tried it. And yep. it's, it's mostly seemed to work out so far. Yeah. And so what was the, what was the experience like at uh, Carnegie Mellon? Because I remember it still is to this day, like, just one of the most extraordinary places yeah. in the world, uh, especially to do computer science and robotics. And, yeah. like, the Robotics Institute is it's just fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. So what, what was that like as a grad student? Uh, for me, personally, it was eye-opening, right, that um, – you would have people come and lecture who had written the textbooks I'd used in undergraduate. And, uh, you know, so meeting 
these people, meeting meeting people that worked at NASA, meeting people who worked at DARPA, meeting you know people from you know Microsoft or Intel at the time, uh, and just it opened up this whole other world of possibility. And then the um, then the the faculty were great, right? There there wasn't really as a graduate student, you didn't see politics. You saw people working together. Um, we got to work on cool things. Uh, you know, the, one of the things I love about Carnegie Mellon is that it's very uh, it's very much a systems school. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they've got incredibly deep, strong, fundamental and theoretical underpinnings, but it's about make it work. And see it out in the real world, and learn learn about that part of um, you know the development and engineering process, and actually touching real things. And so it was it was fantastic. And you know, I got to go up to the Arctic Circle, and we had a robot up there driving around. I got down to go down to the Atacama Desert with a robot, um, and you know, explore that. And it was just it was an incredible experience. What was the first useful robot that you worked on? <laughs> useful? I don't know that I've worked on a truly useful <laughs> robot uh, yet. We're getting closer. Um, no, we um, – so the, the robots we, we built for going to the Arctic, this was a robot called Hyperion. Uh, and we were exploring how can you make uh, a robot think about um, – how can you make it so a robot could operate perpetually? Mm-hmm. So one of the challenges, you send a robot to, to Mars uh, and you put solar panels on it, uh, well, it can only operate when there's enough sunlight. Right. Uh, and it can only operate when there's a communication window back to Earth. So we were looking at both how do you plan so that if you, say, launch it to the pole of a planet, uh, that you have constant power by rotating and driving such that the solar panels always pointed at the sun. And then how do we make... Um, science discovery uh, automated. So instead of asking, you know, should I look at this rock? Should I look at this rock? Should I look at this rock? Have the robot go and look at a bunch of rocks and then try and figure out, hey, this one was unique and interesting in some way and send that back so that you could um, maximize the the use of the, you know, the narrow com bandwidth that was available. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, that was cool. Yeah, did, didn't go anywhere other than, you know, as a research experiment, but some of the technology ended up. And what year was that? Oh, that would have been 2001, I think. We're so that yeah. was before the like the big deep neural network computer vision oh, yeah. Uh, revolution. Yeah. Oh, very much so. This was the you know you spend five years working on your PhD and you make something twenty percent better by coming up with a new set of feature vectors and yeah. you know you earn your PhD. Yeah. yeah. And so your PhD was were were you? I'm, I'm guessing when you're working on robots. There's yeah. such broad systems. So, yeah. like, there's there's the software, and the software is very complicated. It's all the way from control loops to perception to, you know, planning, and it's just a ton of complexity there. And then there's also, like, all of this complexity on the electromechanical side of things. Like, yeah. how do you make it light enough? How do you, like give it the sort of strength and durability to do the things that you want it to do? How do you power it? How do you, like, make it resistant to the environment? Yeah. So did you have one thing or the other that you specialized in or that you gravitated towards? So I was definitely more on the software side um, and kind of the soft software and systems side of how do you how do you think about the whole thing working together. Uh, you know, I'm definitely not a mechanical engineer, right? I, 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 I now now I kind of know enough to be dangerous <laughs> and really frustrating, I'm sure, for the mechanical engineering folks that I work with. Uh, but on the software side, I kind of worked at this intersection of motion planning and perception. Mm-hmm. And so uh, so say a little bit more. What What is uh, motion planning? Yeah. So motion planning is figuring out how do you, how do you make the vehicle move through the world. And... Uh, there's a bunch of different techniques you can use for it, and you you know there's variations where you're thinking about just kinematically what the limits are, uh, and then you think about kinodynamic motion planning where you're actually accounting for the fact that there are dynamics to the motion and inertias. Uh, and so the the earliest robots, like the this robot we took up to the Arctic, it moved at 15 centimeters a second. Mm-hmm. And so you know put that in context, that's like a slow person with a walker. Yep. Um, and and it had to be that slow. Walk. 
Well, one, we actually probably couldn't plan much faster than that. Gotcha. So it was uh, like the the speed yeah. of the processing. Yeah. Just it was, you know, it was complicated. Uh, it was truly off-road. It was also solar powered. Mm-hmm. So we had a, you know, there's a power budget limit given we were we were driving this thing around. And so there's only so much power we could put through the, the gearboxes yeah. Yeah, and the motors. Uh, fascinating. But so even though you were on the software side, like if you are writing planning software and like the planning's software. I mean, like, we just are getting to the point where deep learning systems can learn a kinematic model from scratch. But so, like, these kinematic models are basically, they're they're sort of a model of the physics of the system. Uh, And so, you you do have to understand mechanics uh, in order to write the software. Yeah, you really, you have to look at the kinematics of the vehicle and and figure out, you know, in our case, this vehicle, the the Hyperion robot was four-wheel drive, uh, and it had this cool design, uh, made it much more fun, uh, where the front axle uh, was just there was no active actuation on it. So mm-hmm. if you turned one wheel faster than the other, that would turn the axle. Gotcha. And then if you want to change the the trajectory of the overall vehicle, you're actually driving all four wheels, and you're kind of slipping the back wheels and steering, you know, steering the front wheels. And you know, it's actually a really interesting, as you say, can it, you know. You have to understand the mechanics of it. You have to understand the forces that are interacting to to make it work well. Yeah, and then. I mean, just sort of the perception uh, part of navigating the real world is also complicated. Some of the, yeah. I mean, for a long time before the, some of the more recent advances in perception that are being driven by deep neural networks and GPUs and whatnot, uh, like perception was one of those like uh, real intelligence, artificial intelligence gaps that we really weren't sure when we were going to be able to bridge. And so you were doing all of this work where we were still in that, you know, yeah. universe of confusion about like, will we ever be able to get the perception to be as good as a human? Oh, yeah. And it, and you know, again, it's been fun to watch the what, what we can actually bring into scope and start to solve. So back then, uh, you know, this robot was designed to drive around in the Arctic. It turns out one of the benefits of being in the Arctic is there's nothing there that moves, right? There's just rocks. And so we were using stereo vision systems to reconstruct 3D geometry uh, and then estimating, you know, the load-bearing surface from this and thus figuring out which were the flat bits we could drive on. You know, we were we were not particularly adventurous in the train we would drive over. Uh, and then, you know, the next step from that was looking at um, – there's this great program that I wasn't part of at Carnegie Mellon called Crusher. Mm-hmm. And this was this six-wheeled, multi-ton thing uh, that could move at, you know, I don't know, 30 miles per hour. But it was it was like a little tank. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there, they were figuring out the load-bearing surface. But they were also figuring out, like, what's the stuff you can just drive through? Because if you're, you know, if you're driving a, a tank, uh, it turns out the grass doesn't get in your way, right? The small trees don't get in your way. And so, you know, that was the next level of figuring out what was vegetation, what was the load-bearing surface, you know, what's the slope I can really drive mm-hmm. on. And then a lot of the stuff that I've been associated with over the last decade has been, um, you know, the the actual underlying geometry of the world is pretty simple, right? You drive yep. on a road, it's flat. But now you have all these actors moving through it, whether it's vehicles or bicyclists or motorcycles or pedestrians or, you know, ducks or wheelchairs. Right. Right. And, and so now you have to separate the stuff that moves from the background and be able to track that and then understand that is a car or that is a pedestrian because that – your your model of how they're going to behave in the future is somewhat a function of what you think it is, right? Right. A, a pedestrian – it's very unlikely to move at 60 miles an hour. Right. Uh, you know, whereas a car, you know, that, that can happen. And right. so you, you, the way you, you interact with these vehicles and uh, actors changes. Interesting. Yeah. And so while you were at Carnegie Mellon, like, were you a graduate student or, uh, or faculty? Like, that, the, the DARPA Grand Challenge, uh, like, happens. And I, I remember this was just one of those shockingly cool things as a computer scientist. Like, I... I like I wasn't a roboticist or like even a an AI person, and I was like paying very close attention to this program and what was happening because yeah. at the time it was just sort of shocking the notion that you could have an autonomous vehicle that could like navigate a complicated environment by itself. So you were part of yeah. that. It was really cool. I, it, so this was I was a graduate student, and then I worked for a company, and then I was a faculty member. So I. 
we, you know, kind of went through, you know, three different phases of life, I guess, there. Um, and yeah, it was really cool. And it was a grand challenge because back in 2002, we were not sure you could actually do this. So, um, and and so what what was the this? Yeah. So so the first so there was three different events. There was two grand challenges and then the urban challenge, and the grand challenge was to get a robot. Uh, we called it a robot back then, uh, to drive across the desert to 150 miles nominally from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, mm-hmm. and it had to do it in less than 10 hours, and it had to do it on on a given day. So you know we showed up. Launch the robots in the morning, and you know some number of hours later they come back, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, and and when when it kicked off in in two thousand and probably late two thousand two two thousand three, um, we were like I said, like we had conversations where is this even doable? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there'd been a lot, lot of great work in this space before. There'd been No Hands Across America, which was a Carnegie Mellon program that had actually used neural networks to drive a, a car down the freeway, or at least steer a car down the freeway. It didn't do gas and brake. And there'd been some great work by Ernst Dickmans in, in Europe and some interesting work in Japan. But the idea you'd drive off-road uh, for 150 miles was just, like, it was impossible. The state of the art was some guys had a Humvee driving at, um, I want to say, 10 meters per second through a field with giant hay bales. Mm-hmm. And the idea was don't hit the hay bales. <laughs> and they mostly didn't hit the hay bales. Mostly. Uh, mostly, right? <laughs> and so the idea we could go across the, you know, across the Nevada desert for 150 miles, like on command, you know, and again, a lot of the robotic research at the time and, and still today, rightfully so, is you work really hard at this thing. It's such a brittle system that you get a video of it working the one time, and that's your conference submission, mm-hmm. right? And 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 that's that's the right way it should be, right? In an academic setting, you're kind of trying to prove out ideas. Um, so the idea that we would show up one morning, and you know the starting gun would shoot, and it had to go, and it had to work that time was just it was exhilarating. Um, and the problems, you know, it was it was a classic under defined problem to begin with, where you know. The, we notionally were worried we'd just have to drive across tumbleweed and, and cactus um, for 150 miles and, and truly be off-road. Now, it it kind of morphed into drive down the trails, mm-hmm. which made it more viable and, you know, more useful, honestly. Um, but even that, when, you know, a trail isn't the smooth, perfect ground that we see on the road, right? There's ridges to it and rutting across it. And, yeah, it was it was a heck of a lot of fun. And so— when you were doing all of this, did you think that you were going to be a computer science professor for your entire career? When I, yeah, it was kind of the mission. So, I, you know, I, when I was an undergraduate student was, uh, I want to go to graduate school. Uh, and then when I was a graduate student, I was pretty convinced I wanted to be a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon because it seemed like a great place. Uh, yeah. And ultimately got the opportunity to be that. So that was, that was exciting. Yeah, and sort of an extraordinary thing. And so, you know, in my mind, uh, like uh, as someone who also thought that they were going to be a computer science professor for a while, like getting the faculty gig at Carnegie Mellon is uh, like pretty much the, the top of the mountain. Yeah. Um, so why do something different? Yeah. So in, you know, we I had, I had this chance to work on these challenges for a couple of years and that was exciting. And then I spent a couple of years uh, on the faculty and worked with Caterpillar, and we were all th- automating these these dump trucks that were the size of houses, yep. right? Like 400-ton thing moving at 45 miles an hour. Shockingly big. It's amazing. Uh, just incredibly cool. And a great team with Caterpillar, a great team at the university. Um, and I'd been talking with Sebastian Thrun, uh, who was at Google at the time, and we were thinking we should do something around self-driving cars. Again, we still didn't – we call them, you know, car robots or something. I don't know what we called them, but we hadn't invented that term for them yet. And, you know, he was at Google, and I got a phone call saying, you know, effectively, like, we'd actually like to do self-driving cars at Google. Uh, And this is 2008. So Google had quietly just very recently acquired Android. Mm -hmm. um, And that was, you know, it was a search engine. I was like, what on earth? Why? (laughs) <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. And um, and we talked about it, and I came to realize that they 
you know, Larry and Sergey thought they had this incredible engineering resource and wanted to go solve cool, interesting problems. And they were asking me to come out and lead the team. Um, and I thought, well, you know, and, and, and initially it was a, it was a two year gig. The idea was we come out, see what we could do for two years. Um, and you know, it's kind of like the Dread Pirate Roberts, you know, you know, good day today will probably kill you in the morning, right? Yeah. Like, well, you're going to be gone in two years. And yeah. And I want to like, I want to draw a line under this because I, I think now people probably almost take for granted that Google having Waymo and like all of the self-driving car stuff yeah. is was just sort of an ine- inevitable consequence of how things were going. But I, I was at Google from 03 to 07, so I left before you got there. But you started close enough after my last day that like the company w- it was a search and ads yeah. company uh, and like the idea that I mean you had two things you had this company that like it wasn't obvious I no. think to anyone that they should be building self-driving cars no. um, and like I'm not saying that in a pejorative way it's just you know it's not what they did. Yeah, it's not yeah. what they did. And the state of the technology was also uh, nascent enough where it just wasn't obvious that uh, commercially, like, you could make a profit on yeah. any of this stuff uh, on any sort of reasonable time horizon. And so them having the idea to do that and you sort of saying this would be a, a cool enough thing to do to take, uh, take, sabbatical, a, yeah. take a sabbatical for my tenure track job at the number one computer science program in the I – mean, yeah. like that, that Required a lot of courage all the way around. Yeah, no, and it was, it, yeah, it, and it was, it was a big decision because, like, this was the thing that I had aspired to for the last seven years, and, um, and it wasn't obvious that it was a good idea, uh, it, but it seemed like you know, I, my wife and I, we just had our first son and our second, and we were thinking, well, I, I've, I've got this opportunity here, but. You know, we could go try California for a couple of years. And we're like, you know, this is where the crazy people with the Birkenstocks are. Um, so, you know, if we're going to go, we may as well go give it a shot now. And then we can come back and, and pick up here afterwards. And and it was – so Carnegie Mellon has this tradition in the Robotics Institute where in the fall, the new faculty members come in and uh, talk about their research and their aspirations and whatnot. And, and there was three of us. And, you know, I came in and did my – you know, little thing, and at the end of it said, and by the way, um, I'm, you know, now it's, because I, I think I was special faculty, and then I was faculty, faculty. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm leaving for two years. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, and <laughs> went over about as well as you might think. Uh, but, you know, it was, it's to their credit, they, they let me do it. Yeah. Um, and to Google's credit, and, and Larry and Sergey's, you know, they had the foresight to try this out, and it really was, can we, we went into it with no degree of confidence that it, it would go anywhere. Uh, just go try it. What did your dad think of this? Or, or you, your mom? Um, they were very supportive, right? It was, yeah. it just seemed like a neat opportunity. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think, I think if I had left to try a startup, I think that would have been a little more, you know, I can tell you actually, they were a little more skeptical of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, the opportunity to, uh, to go there, they they got it. Yeah, I know my mom was uh, was really anxious uh, for reasons I didn't quite understand when I left Google to go do a startup. Yeah, it's like just very hard for her to reason about like how you could leave a good job like that to yeah. go try this like very risky thing. Yeah, no, and and it is right. I think one of the things that people outside of Silicon Valley and haven't been here don't realize is that it's not really that like you know people talk about silicon valley um engineers being risk takers and i think it's it's actually the opposite it's the realization that if you go and try one of these things and you're actually good at what you do if it fails it fails you yeah. you, you have a job the next day at somewhere else right and you'll have this wealth of experience that people will value yeah uh, and i think that is something that it's that it's hard you know i'll, I'll categorize this as you know, East Coast people, but, you know, kind of more conventional um, business folks haven't, don't kind of have that sense of the opportunities that are around. And, and maybe we've just been here during a particularly fortuitous time. 
Yeah, but I, I do think it's a piece of advice that I give people all the time is that if you, however you do it, like whether it's like be a software engineer in Silicon Valley where you've got a bunch of career opportunities or whether it's avoiding taking on like huge amounts of debt early on in your life, if you can give yourself the opportunity yeah. to be able to have choice in what you work on uh, and to like – always choose the thing that's interesting and looks like it's going to give you a bunch of learning, uh, like you will probably do better than you would in other circumstances. Oh, for sure. There's, you know, this, uh, what is it? If you if you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. Right? Like that, it's not just that, right? It's that you get the best out of yourself. You get the best out of people when they're invested in the thing that they're doing, when yeah. they're passionate about it. And, yeah. You know, and it's, I guess it's easy for me to say, having been in a position where I've had the opportunity to do this, and I, you know, understand that not everybody has the same opportunities that I've had. Uh, but if you can find that, if you can, if you are able to seek it out, it seems like the the way that you get a chance to shine and the way that you help build something yeah. awesome. So tell me about the early days of the self driving car program at Google. So it started. It was like you and Sebastian. Yeah. Well, there was there was. Um, I want to say there was a half dozen of us who started at the beginning. There was me and uh, Dmitry Dolgov, who's now the CTO there. Uh, he and I started on the same day. And Dirk and Mike Montemurlo, who was actually an office mate of mine at Carnegie Mellon and, you know, is one of the you know, brilliant minds in simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, and um, who else? There was, oh, Henrik. So, we, you know, we were, we, were, we were very much a black project. So, you know, we were – kind of swore to secrecy. We were kind of hanging out in the Google Maps building, but didn't really, um, you know, people didn't really know what we were working on because it was kind of weird. Mm -hmm. um, and it was how do we learn as quickly as possible? How do we show, you know, sh how do we convince ourselves that we could actually build something meaningful uh, with this technology? And so uh, we had two, two goals. Uh, when we started, the first one was to drive 100,000 miles on public roads, and then the other was to drive 10 100-mile really interesting routes. Mm -hmm. And the idea was kind of to get kind of statistically interesting coverage and, like, focused ability to learn about particular places we could go. And so, and and it was like drive safely four hundred thousand miles on public roads, right? I mean, like yeah. I I, well, I I know that it's implicit in what yeah, you're saying. It, it bears saying because one of the things that I think you all did extraordinarily well is like you were very. Uh, thoughtful and even conservative in a way with the choices that you made to make sure that safety was always the number one thing. Yeah, that, that was one of the things that, that I helped uh, instill in the organization early on. And, and we had a great group of people who, who would have done it without me. But how do we think about um, training people to operate the vehicle? How do we transfer the knowledge from the engineering team to the operations team so they understood what was going on? Uh, how do we, what processes do we put in place so that we have people checking one another? How do we make sure that, you know, we trust the release software going out to them? So, yeah, that was, that was a really important part of it. And it's one of, that's one of the fundamental bits of culture that I helped instill there that I'm very proud of and, and one of the cores of the way we operate at Aurora as well. Yeah. So, you had these two goals uh, yeah. and nascent technology. So, and this is 2008. 2009. Yeah. I started February 2009. Okay. So, yeah. And, and so, we did exactly what engineers do. We, we optimized to the constraints. <laughs> uh, and so, for the 100,000 miles, uh, the vast majority of that was uh, driving on 280. Uh, between 85 and Sneath. Um, and so we had a fleet of, uh, of, of Toyota Priuses. And if you lived here in 2000 and, uh, 2010, you would have seen a bunch of them going up and down on the freeway there. Yep. Gathering 100,000 yeah, miles. Yeah, you guys were on my commute. Uh, my startup was in yes. San Mateo, and I lived in San Jose, so I was on the 280 every day. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, they, they, they got incrementally better over time, and, you know, we, we burned through the 100,000 miles. It was really kind of, it was kind of a fun time because, you know, people didn't know what they were, right? We had people think they were weather trackers. They, they thought we were storm chasers. Um, they thought this was my, one of my favorite. I was at a gas station. 
uh, and somebody was convinced we had kind of a perpetual motion machine, mm -hmm. um, which is on its face a problem because we're at the gas station. <laughs> but, um, you know, like the, the laser that was spinning on the roof was clearly a wind turbine. And yeah. at the time, we had this encoder on the rear wheel. Uh, and so that, you know, their model was we were gathering from the wind, from the car driving, yeah. and then we were recuperating energy through the encoder on the wheel. And it's one of these things where we couldn't tell them what we were doing, so we kind of not along. I, I knew a lot of people who uh, who knew Google's business uh, who thought that they might have something to do with Street View. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember we had a we had we we were definitely that. We had um, one time we were driving back. We were up in Sacramento or Tahoe testing, driving back through uh, that stretch of eighty, um, just kind of where it's really flat. And it turns out there's a part of that where there's like a, a parallel road. And we're driving along, and this motorbike passes us, cuts over to the parallel road, and then pops a wheelie. And for like three quarters of a mile, it's just doing a wheelie beside our car. And <laughs> I am sure that for the next two or three years, that guy was still checking for the Street View footage of him doing his <laughs> wheelie and thought, yeah, so, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Good times. <laughs> so what had to change uh, after you accomplish the initial goals. So the initial goals were good yeah. ones, but like that is not like how you get to a commercial business for self-driving cars. No, it, and it became okay, we've 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 started to we've got this initial proof point that the technology at least can work some of the time um, on traffic on public roads with real people. So now how does this turn into a product? What is the application we're going to go after? Um, what is kind of the MVP? And the first thing we we thought about was basically what looks like autopilot today mm -hmm. um, on on Tesla, except um, we set a very very high reliability goal, so that you really could kind of take your eyes off the road for periods of time. And so we spent a couple of years working towards that. Um, and you know, I've talked in the past about some of the experience we had at that. At the point we we got to a point where it was extremely good. And then we started to dog food it, um, and you know, despite warning people about the fact that a it was beta, uh, and and b you know, effectively we knew where they lived, we worked for the company, um, we were going to monitor what they did. We saw them, you know, being overly confident in it, and you know, re you know, checking things in the back of the car or putting on their makeup, all kinds of things that you you wouldn't want. So then, we moved from that to. How do we turn this into something that really can drive, do the whole driving task for you? Uh, and, you know, in particular thinking about how do we move people. Right. And so at some point you decided that you were going to go start a company, yeah. uh, which is what you're doing right now. So Aurora, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I had a tremendous time at Google. It was um, an incredible opportunity to work with great people, you know, good company and go and and build something neat. Uh, and then in, by the time um, we got to about 2016, um, it was time for me to move on. So I resigned in the middle of 2016 and then spent a few months trying to figure out what to do next. Um, and I met with all kinds of people and, and you know, from tech companies to automotive companies to startups. And, you know, it was, it was fascinating because after you spend that much time at a company, you kind of get used to seeing the world through a particular lens. I mean, able to get outside of that lens and engage with people more as an individual and kind of kind of deconstruct a lens, you, you learn a lot through that process. And, and what became clear to me was there was a chance to help accelerate this technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and that given the experience I had and given kind of the state of the industry at the time, it seemed like... Uh, if I could find great people to found a company with, we could really do something meaningful as an independent company and, you know, build technology that mattered and see it in the world in a way that we could do a lot of good, uh, you know, and ultimately build a sustainable, successful business. Yep. And so what does Aurora do? So Aurora's mission is to deliver the benefits of self-driving technology safely, quickly, and broadly. Uh, and what that means is we want to make um, a driver – uh, that will make it easier for people to get around, make it less expensive for them to get around, and easier for us to, to ship uh, goods and, and perform logistics. 
And you all think about yourself as a platform company. So anybody who wants to build an application that needs self-driving cars, like they could use your technology yeah. to like help realize it. That's exactly right. That we think about the thing that we can do best in the world is build the driver. Uh, and so let's go do that. People, you know, it, it's easy. You look at, say, Uber, and what you see is an app that you figure, how hard can that be? And, and what you miss is just how complicated that business is behind the scenes and the, you know, the operational aspects of it, the matching driver with vehicle uh, or passenger with vehicle. If you look at, again, if you look at a company like FedEx, um, right, it's incredibly complicated, the logistics that they do. Um, and so we don't want to go build that, right? We think those people know what they're doing. They're really good at it. Similarly, um, you know, it's really easy to dismiss an automotive company, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, they just, you know, they just bend metal. Well, no, it turns out that they build these incredibly complicated products that operate for the next 15 years and have an immense amount of technology under the hood. And so, you know, we don't want to do that either. We're, we're not going to be very good at that. So let's, um, let's concentrate on this one thing, this driver, and let's make it a platform that everyone can use that will make it, for the end user, it'll make it safer for them to get around. It'll make it easier and it'll make it less expensive. And then for the, our partners in the automotive community and in the transportation and logistics communities, um, you know, they'll have uh, an opportunity to help build better businesses themselves. Right. And the idea is, like, there will be lots and lots of these businesses, like, not a small number, but, like, you will have maybe hundreds or thousands of companies that are, like, instantiating some sort of AI driver in a, in a vehicle right. of some sort. And the vehicle could be your giant 400-ton Caterpillar thing, or it could be, uh, like, a, a consumer-owned automobile that you're using to commute to work, or it could be uh, a completely unma unmanned uh, drone vehicle of some type. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. That I, I think I don't have enough imagination, and we probably as a team don't, to figure out how all the ways, all the great ways this could be used out in the world. Uh, so again, stick the thing we know how to do, open it up, and, and let it flourish. So... One of the things I'm really interested in is your perspective on what has changed in the technology over the history of autonomous vehicles from the point where you entered, which was pretty early, you know, like, you know, sort of Grand Challenge, uh, you know, DARPA um, problem all the way through to 2020. Yeah. No, oh, it's it's been incredible. Um you know, you could start by thinking about the hardware side of this uh, and maybe even the mundane hardware side. So uh, vehicles are now almost all electronic. And so you can communicate to the brake system or the steering wheel or you can talk to the gas pedal, right? Uh, and that wasn't the case. We literally had a motor with an arm on it that would press the brake pedal. Uh, mm -hmm. in those earliest vehicles. That would compress a hydraulic cylinder yeah, yeah. somewhere. And, and, and they all still have hydraulic cylinders, but the, the front end of them now, almost all of them, there's There's, there's no mechanical form. linkage. Oh, sorry. No, no, there actually is in, in cars. Okay. But there's on top of that, there's also an electronic control. Okay. Um, and that's actually one of the and, challenges. And, and so you have the mechanical linkage for safety? So today, yes. And, and this is actually one of the areas where there's still... Um, steps that have to be made before we will see broad distribution of this technology. So this is fascinating. Like, this is some of the minutia I think yeah. we, uh, we like, sort of skate over sometimes when we're thinking about these technologies. But, like, one of the things that the auto industry does incredibly well is, like, they understand manufacturing for safety perhaps better than any other industry, maybe other than aerospace much, uh, yeah. in the world. Um, and, like, they have thought about this problem so deeply and for so long. Uh, oh, yeah. And, th and that's why it's so great to work with them on these kind of problems. So when you And, and let's, let's take one very specific example. So let's talk about the brake system on a car. So the way that works today is uh, when you press the brake pedal, you're actually pressing. You've got a, a metal arm that's going in and compressing a cylinder. That's the master cylinder that's then creating pressure, hydraulic pressure in your brake system. And, and that brake system is actually split into two circuits that are generally diagonally linked across the vehicle so that if one of them fails, you've still got two brakes. And it turns out that the torques applied by the brakes on the wheels don't uh, don't spin the car when you apply the brakes. You don't have as much authority, but you yep. still have brake power. Now, and that's a mechanically like brilliant design. 
Awesome. And then what's happened is with the introduction of more advanced features, uh, like first electronic stability control uh, and now adaptive cruise control, uh, there needs to be a way for a computer to actuate some part of the brake system. And uh, with electronic stability control, you're actually modulating whether that pressure that's being applied by the master cylinder is is effectively um, on or off. Right. Uh, around that, uh, and with uh, adaptive cruise control, you're actually wanting to generate pressure itself. Now, in both of these systems, uh, the redundancy, you know, so if the, electronics, if the electronic system fails, you're still able to apply pressure through that master cylinder system. Uh, and so you, you know, the force of actuating the brakes is coming from your legs. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have a robot driving, if it's a self-driving car, then there's nothing applying that force. And so we need to design new brake systems where there's, you know, uh, parallel systems to actuate the force. And so this is one of the the parts that will become standard on vehicles as we move to uh, to automate them. And similarly around the steering shaft, right, the steering column. So mm-hmm. the backup in if the power steering system breaks is your, you know, your arm muscles. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you are a self-driving vehicle with nobody grabbing the steering wheel – then we have to come up with an alternative system for backup. And so it's, you know, interesting things like dual well motors or second motors on the shaft. And so in addition to, like, re-engineering the cars themselves to have new forms of mechanical redundancy, like, you also have to think about how you make the software redundant. Uh, Like, this is one of the things that wasn't obvious at all to me when I first started learning about uh, self-driving vehicles is I think people have in their imagination that the software is this one monolithic machine learned mm-hmm. thing that is doing all of the perceiving of the environment and all of the you know sort of driving and reacting to the environmental conditions and like that is not the way the systems are engineered. Yeah. So so you don't necessarily need to make it redundant, but you need to have a certain level of resiliency in it. Um, and redundancy is one way that you could implement that level of resiliency. Uh, and so you, you could imagine having two teams working, you know, kind of in, in closed rooms and, and come up with solutions. Or you can do more thoughtful things about how you take more thoughtful approaches where you think about how the system can fail uh, and mitigate those to a point where you've reduced the risk to the point where it's on, you know, it's no longer unreasonable. One of the benefits we have over aviation uh, is that we're on the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we just need to take the kinetic energy out of the system and, and bring it to a safe state. Um, in aviation, you know, if, like you'll ultimately take the kinetic energy out, but it's going to be a very bad day. Yeah. Um, so it's a slightly different problem. Uh, and so you probably don't need the full kind of the full degree of redundancy, but you need something where you're you're kind of meeting your your safety targets. And so how do you think about um, sort of interpretability of these models that are yeah. are I mean, so like one of the one of the things that, that I learned about over the past couple of years is uh, in airplanes, you have this thing called uh, MCAS, so the Mid-Air Collision Avoidance System. And so every modern uh, modern airplane has MCAS. And like yeah. MCAS's job is to uh, sort of look at all of the air traffic. And if you get close, too close to another plane, uh, the, the planes communicate with one another and like one will go up and the other yeah. will go down in order to avoid the collision from happening. And there's a document. Uh, so there's two versions of this MCAS. So there's the the old version of MCAS that is described in a document that has a bunch of pseudocode and it's like hundreds of pages long. Uh, and there is a new version of MCAS, which is, uh, you know, sort of a, almost like a dynamic programming based thing. So it's yeah. it's not full huh. machine learning, but uh, like all of its decision points are like codified in a, in a table. Uh, and the argument is that like even though it's not this human readable pseudocode that uh, this new system has uh, better provability uh, properties that it's going to do what it's yeah. uh, going to do. Uh, although like from a human perspective, it's probably less easily decipherable. Understandable, yeah. um, and like if you look at the pseudocode, like the pseudocode is sort of a wreckage, like it's full of inconsistencies uh-huh. and, you know, it's no one really understands 100% yeah. of like what the thing says that these systems should do. And so like one step further along this 
um, level of sort of human inscrutability are these like machine learned sure, models yeah. that we're building right now where they are very large and like how they you, you can't easily learn how they behave by just inspecting the weights of the uh, you know parameters that are sort of in the interior of the model. So like how do you think about this because like yeah. you're, you're working on one of the most important safety critical systems in in software engineering. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a great question and and I, and the way you talked about it actually is a really great way to frame it because uh as we started to bring machine learning into these systems um people began to really worry about this like can we trust the ML system? Well, if you knew anything about the way these perception algorithms had been implemented before, it's like it was pretty darn opaque, right? You you couldn't, you know, you've got feature vectors that you're creating and parameters you're tweaking and, you know, weird case statements that happen to work and like, you know, so it's it's the same problem uh, because by the time these perception systems actually worked, even if you human coded it, it was not human readable per yep. se. Uh, and so the way we think about this is, there are some strict don't violate. Uh, we call them guardrails. Mm -hmm. That you know, our vehicle shouldn't plan to be in the same space as another vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, our vehicle should uh, not plan to leave the road. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and there's a bunch of the stuff that we can kind of codify, uh, and they're relatively straightforward and relatively. You, you can write a requirement for it. You can trace that and use kind of classic engineering approaches. To and do and you can write a piece of software where a human being can look at it and say, like, this software enforces this guardrail. Right. And you can put testing around it and, you know, have confidence that you're implementing that. And then – and so we use – we do that. And then we take the machine learned approach and basically stick it in the guardrails. Uh, and so, you know – we don't kid ourselves in believing that we could really interpret all of the weights in that system, but we put rails around it so that we kind of bound the uh, the operating environment. Uh, and we believe that that will get us to a point where we can have enough confidence in the system that it that it really works. And and theoretically, I mean, one of the things that we've seen over and over again is you you have these moments with complicated systems where you start off not being able to really understand and characterize the performance of the complex system, and so you don't really trust them. And in certain of these com complex systems, they eventually evolve to the point where you both understand them and they have superior performance yeah. to, like, everything that preceded them. And in some cases, yes. you know, the thing that preceded them was, like, a human brain and, like, the software system is – better at that narrow thing yeah. than a human brain. Like, no, no, like, I think it bears saying that no piece of software is close to being better than a complete human brain at right. the complete set of things that human brains are good at. But, but at, at narrow things, yes. Yeah. Uh, and so, like, we may get to the point, and, like, it would be a fantastic thing for the human race to, like, have, uh, have a autonomous driving system that is better than a human from a safety perspective. And, and that's what our aspiration is. And the good news is that I don't even know that we need to be strictly better than the best human driver at all times because yeah. a lot of times when people are driving, they're not paying that much attention. Yeah. Right? They're, they're distracted one way or the other. Their mind wanders. Uh, they're inebriated, right? There's, there's an awful lot of error that happens not because we're operating at our best and couldn't handle it. It's yeah. because our attention is somewhere else. One, you know, and one of the things that we can do for these vehicles is we can make them superhuman, um, and and superhuman in kind of trivial ways. Yeah. Like our vehicles see all the way around the vehicle, all the time, and and now that I'm used to that in the technology, when I'm trying to make a lane change on the 101, it drives me nuts because yeah. you know to make a lane change, I'm watching traffic in front, and then I need to look and assess the state of the traffic behind me. Yep. And you know what happens if you know particularly when it's kind of jerky flow of traffic, you know, if I'm taking a half second or three quarters of a second to look behind me and the guy in front of me's hit the brakes, I'm having a bad day. So I find that incredibly stressful. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing already about a modern automobile, like forget whether or not it has autonomous technology yeah. in it or is like on a path to autonomous technology. From a sensing perspective, like modern automobiles are already superhuman. Like they can see the world uh, like like just because they can see behind yeah. them at, at the same time they can see yeah. in front of them, uh, like they, you know, like your 
the cars that you all uh, you know pioneered at Google have lidars in them, yeah. and so like they can sort of see in dimensions that human beings can't see. Yeah. It's it's really cool, and it's it's one of these things where this is this is why I believe we should be using a combination of laser radar and camera, and not just one modality, um, because you know like. The people who believe that you should just use cameras, for example, they say, you know, the argument is effectively people just have two eyes. It's like cameras. We should just use that. And the obvious response to this is, look, um, people don't have wheels for legs. But it turns out when we made the car, wheel is much better than trying to make <laughs> legs work. Um, so let's go use whatever engineering hacks we can to go make this safer. Yeah. Uh, and so when we can use lasers, which... Um, allow direct 3D reconstruction of the geometry of the world when we can use radars that allow us to to see through certain obscurance and allow us to see velocity instantaneously. Uh, when we use cameras to see the state of traffic lights and get higher resolution data, like we should use it all. One of the things I'm really excited about at Aurora is uh, we just bought this company uh, that builds this brand new kind of uh, LIDAR technology. It's called Frequency Modulated Continuous Wave LIDAR. And what's uh, what's LIDAR for folks who don't uh, know? LIDAR is uh, uh, light detection and ranging. So think of it like radar, but instead of using a radio wave, you're using uh, a beam of light. Yep. Um, and for for this technology, so the way kind of classic LIDAR, so the, the LIDARs we used to use at Google and, and most of the LIDARs that are out there that you'll see on cars, um, the way it works is you send out a pulse of light and you wait, wait for it, goes out in the world, bounces off something, comes back, and you measure how long it took for that little pulse to go out and come back. Uh, and because the speed of light is constant, you can get distance from that. Uh, now, the trick is you have to make that pulse so bright that it is brighter than everything else out there because otherwise you don't see it when it comes back. Yep. And so that means it's got to be brighter than the sun. Which is incredibly bright. Yes. Now, the good news is you're looking over a small period of time, so you can kind of do it and maybe you don't, you know, you don't necessarily care because not many cars come out of the sun. Yeah. Uh, but it makes it, you know, you you're basically have this really challenging signal noise problem because right. you're, you're, you're doing DC, um, uh, DC measurements. Yeah. With this FMCW technology, what's happening is instead of sending a pulse out, you're sending out a continuous wave. Uh, and you watch that go out, hit the world, and come back. And now you interfere the outbound wave with the inbound wave and look at the phase oh, difference. Oh, interesting. And now you measure the phase difference effectively, and that tells you uh, how far away the thing is that it's reflecting off of. And what's cool is that because of this neat um, physical property of self-heterodyne, you get you know, 10 to 100 to 1 um, amplification, uh, which is that's you know, and, great. And, and because you're no longer at DC, you know, you're, you're filtering out stuff that isn't at this frequency, so you don't, like, turns out the sun is roughly constant. Right. So it doesn't, there's no frequency to that. So, you know, it makes it so you can be much more sensitive. And then the other really cool thing that comes along with this is that you actually get to measure velocity instantaneously. Mm -hmm. So using Doppler. So that's the, you know, when you hear a siren go by and how it changes pitch, yep. that's the Doppler shift in that, in that audio signal. So with this is we're measuring vehicles at distance with each one of those measurements that come back through that pulse we, or through that, that wave. Um, so you can actually, tell whether you're accelerating or decelerating relative okay. to that other uh, and, object. And not just whether we are exactly what the delta in speed is. Right. Uh, and, and so this, the reason why Aurora, why we bought this company, why we brought this technology in-house is it's magical, right? Because um, uh, if you're trying to use a normal LiDAR, uh, to measure the world out. Let's say we want to see whether there's something 200 meters out in front of us on the road. And we want to know, is that a truck or is that um, a pedestrian or is that a bicycle um, or something else? Uh, we need to get enough points on that, uh, little dots back from it that allow us to see the shape of it and then we need to run a classifier on it. So you need to get a whole lot of points on mm -hmm. it because if you only had, you know, if I have two dots back from something, I can't, you know, that's a line. Right. I can't tell whether that's a person or a dump truck, you know, or a Bugatti or whatever. Right. Um, and, and so that's that's a lot of points. It's, it turns out a really hard problem. In contrast, if I hit that thing with an FMCW lighter and can measure the speed of it, uh, well, if it moves at 60 miles per hour. It's I mean, not a human. Right. It may not be a, I don't know if it's a Bugatti or a dump truck. But I know it's a vehicle. Uh, and so I can classify it much sooner so I can respond to it much more quickly. Uh, Super interesting. Yeah, it's it's really cool stuff. Yeah, and like that 
I mean, the safety applications of that must be interesting. So, like, you can pay really close attention to stationary things. Yeah. Yeah, low speed things, you know, you know, you can you understand you have this whole additional signal that we can incorporate into the classification and thus make us more robust and make us react more quickly. Fascinating. So a couple more questions before we go. So one is uh, like looking forward, like what's the thing that you're most excited about uh, in the autonomous vehicle space? Oh, Aurora, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but like, what, like at Aurora, like what's the what's the interesting oh. thing that's uh, that's that's yeah. going to happen over the next handful of years? So, so over the next handful of years, you know, we're going to get to the point where we have vehicles on the road that we can trust, and that they'll be doing. They'll almost certainly be in fleet applications, and they'll be driving around. And I think that's going to be really exciting. Over the next year, there's a couple of things we're really excited about. One is. Um, we talked earlier about Aurora building a driver, and it's it's this platform. Well, uh, because we now have this special LiDAR capability, we're now confident that we can build vehicles that can drive on the freeway. So Aurora spent a lot of time building passenger vehicles or passenger vehicle technology. We're now going to be moving into logistics and trucking. And so that'll be a big thing for us over this next year. Um, we're also going to be putting an awful lot of effort into codifying our safety process mm-hmm. uh, and kind of convincing ourselves, going, getting along the road to convincing ourselves that this vehicle really is sufficiently safe that we can trust it out in the world. And those are two, you know, really big kind of chunks for us over this next year. And then, of course, we're going to continue on the core driving technology and moving that, you know, moving that from, you know, the the capabilities we have today to more and more competent driving. That's yeah, super awesome. So last question. Um, I, I do all sorts of uh, things that are somewhat orthogonal uh, to software engineering and technology to uh, it's almost like meditation. My latest thing is uh, like I have uh, I have uh, access to a machine shop, and I'm like doing a bunch of a uh, bunch of CNC machining, uh, which is incredibly fun and uh, like exactly what I need to get my brain detached uh, long enough from the things that I normally think about, where I can uh, like go think even more clearly about the things that I should be thinking about. So what, what's the interesting things that you do in your uh, copious free time? <laughs> copious free time. <laughs> yeah. I, so, so, you know, I have a startup that mm-hmm. I helped found, so that's, that's almost all of it. Yeah. I, I think the two things that I would, uh, that I like doing, so one is uh, I like rock climbing. So I mm-hmm. do uh, indoor rock climbing because... My wife is not excited about me climbing outdoors. Yeah. Uh, but I find that to be just, when I get the chance to do it, it, you know, it's this blend of, you know, the physical exertion of climbing. You know, yeah. I'm not a small guy. And so, you know, there's a lot more work for me than some people. Yeah. Uh, but then the real interesting part is when you climb it at the higher grades, it's a puzzle. Yeah. And how do you load this rock so that you, you know, so you can actually hold it rather than just slip off it? Right? How do you contort your body up the wall? If I, it's just, I enjoy that, right? It's, it's a workout and it's thoughtful. Um, and then the other is uh, I play, we play games with, our, our, with my kids, right? Yeah. And uh, we're into these uh, fantasy flight games, which there's this one called Imperial Assault where mm-hmm. – um, you know, the, there's a team that plays the heroes, and then I get to play the Empire. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, you, you have these Star Wars battles, which are oh, a lot that's of fun. A, sounds like a ton of fun. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's super awesome. I mean, on the rock climbing thing, like I, you must uh, follow Alex Honnold uh, a bit. Uh, so he's the he's the climber who's like famous for free soloing yeah. uh, the what was it, the Dom Wall uh, yeah. for El Cap. I find him absolutely fascinating. Just the mental preparation that goes into. I mean, like there's the physical aspect, which yeah. I can't even conceive of no. like, physically how he does what he does, but the mental preparation that he goes through to be able to do what he does is like maybe even more fascinating than the physical side of things. Yeah, I thought it was really incredible. I, I actually, one of the most impressive things to me about that movie was the aborted attempt. Yeah, that I, you know, the the self awareness um, and confidence and self-confidence, you know, particularly with the big film crew there and everything, and this has been the thing you've been working to, to be up on 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 the, the face at some point and just say, you know what, I'm not feeling it. Uh, and, you know, and abort, right? Like, 
I think that was the most impressive thing to me in that whole movie, yeah. that, that he was able to do that. Yeah, I uh, I have a keen enough sense of vertigo that I haven't actually watched the movie, but uh, I have uh, <laughs> I have uh, I've watched a bunch of interviews with him. Uh, it just sounds extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. I think people that do that kind of thing, there's just something special about them, right? Yeah. In, in one way or another. Yeah, I love this incredible diversity in human beings where. There's so many people who are so obsessed with being really great at their particular thing. Yeah. And I, I, I just love it. I love it all. Like, it, it makes me so happy to, like, see this guy. And it's, like, not just him. Like, there's so many uh, these rock climbers who are just extraordinary at what they do. And, like, I'm amazed at concert pianists and I'm amazed at roboticists. And yep. I'm, I, I mean, it's just, yeah. like, what a great thing it is to be a human being. <laughs> it is. Right? There's, I don't know if you've watched this the YouTube video. People are People are awesome, mm-hmm. uh, and, and it's it's that it's like the, all these crazy things, you know, people juggling while on a unicycle <laughs> or doing, you know, and and it's just like, yeah, the, like the diversity that is humanity, and and the fact that people there's so many things out there and people can pick them up, and yeah, it, I I wonder about my lack of imagination, right? That <laughs> you know, I see some of these things and I think, you know, you see it after the fact, you think. That's incredible. And then I think I could, it would never have occurred to me to do that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a bit of a shame some days. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure that there are plenty of people who look at you and have the same reaction. Uh, I, I think building, uh, building autonomous robots and like trying to help uh, self driving cars come into the world uh, seems like an inscrutable, almost impossible thing uh, to some folks. But like, thank goodness we have people who are uh, captivated by the idea of trying to do it and have the you know determination to try to make it happen. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Much. Yeah, and so with that, uh, thank you for being on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks. Awesome. All right. So that was Kevin Scott chatting with Chris Ermson. And, you know, Kevin, as we were discussing before the interview, one of the things I think that is so interesting about Aurora and about Chris's journey is the fact that, you know, he's not— Aurora is not just building, you know, self-driving hardware, which a, a lot of different companies and startups are doing, but they're really looking at, you know, building an entire platform around self-driving technologies. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really, I mean, one of the things that Chris said in the in the interview about this platform approach that um, that really rings true to me is like he doesn't believe that they have sufficient imagination inside of Aurora to conceive of all of the many things that you may want to do with a uh, AI driver. Um, and like, I totally agree with that. So I think it's, it's, it's really presumptuous to think that one company or even one industry is going to have all of the best ideas about what to do with a really transformational technology like autonomous driving. And like the, it makes me really happy that there's a company like Aurora out there that is building things in a platform way where hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of companies will be able to use their technology to realize the vision that they have for what you could do with an autonomous uh, driving agent. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. Uh, the potential there is so great, and I think that is is interesting as it is and important as it is for lots of different companies to be coming up with their own solutions, there's real value in a platform, right? Like if we really want this sort of technology to have transformational effects, it can't just be, you know, focused on on one, you know, automaker or um, or, or one technology company. It, it needs to be something that, that people can build off of, you know, a platform, which has historically been what has made other companies, whether they're, you know, technology-based or otherwise, really successful. So I agree with you. I think the potential there is tremendous. Yeah, the other thing, too, that's interesting um, that I've been thinking a lot about, and I I write a little bit about this in uh, the book that I've got that's coming out in April, is the whole thing about platform companies is that you measure your success in terms of the successes of people who are using their technology to accomplish their, their goals. And so if you think about... AI and its potentially negative, disruptive impacts on the world, you're much less likely to have 
um, like weird sort of reconcentrations of economics uh, with a platform company than you are with someone who's trying to like build a set of technologies that like completely disrupt an entire industry. Um, yeah, so like the platform gives a whole bunch of people opportunities to build new economically viable um, businesses that do useful things for large numbers of people that it allows you to have more, you know, sort of inclusive and diverse points of view and perspectives participating in the development of products. Um, and like, I think net net, that is a good thing for the world uh, to like have these like really complicated platform components that are available to a huge number of people so they can go, uh, you know, sort of express their creativity and where the economics are lined up in a way where the the platform, the builders of the complicated technology only get rewarded when the people that they're empowering are, are successful themselves. No, totally. And I mean, and at a certain point, you could even think about it like, you know, disruption will come, but it will come from those people who are building on top of things. It's not necessarily going to be directly, you know, tied to the platform itself, um, which which I think is probably a good way of doing things and, and making things um, more available to, to lots of different types of people. Yep. Awesome. Well, that's the end of our show for today. And as always, we would love to hear from you. You can reach out to us anytime at BehindTheTech at Microsoft.com. Tell us what's on your mind. Tell us your New Year's resolution. And of course, be sure to tell all your friends, your colleagues, you know, your self-driving cars, if that's what you've got, <laughs> you know, your your your, uh, your assistants, uh, your voice assistants, your Uber drivers, whatever. Be sure to tell them all about our show. And thank you for listening. All right. See you next time. 